so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak today, and especially for all of you for sticking around after a, a very long day. So hopefully um, this will be informative to you. Um, so I was asked to talk about epilepsy in uh, Vail McDermott syndrome. And I thought, I, I believe this is the first time anyone has specifically talked about seizures. Um, I know many people sort of mention seizures um, during their talks, but I think it's the first time anyone's specifically talk to you about epilepsy um, in family McDermott syndrome. So I thought I would, would take an approach of uh, sort of starting from some basic concepts and then moving on to uh, more information about epilepsy and autism in general, and then finally ending with uh, what we know about epilepsy in uh, 22Q13 deletion syndrome. Uh, so I, because of that, I know many people have very specific questions, um, and I may not address everyone's question, um, all, all of um, everyone's questions, but hopefully I'll, I'll provide some information um, for you about epilepsy. So um, things I want to talk about today include, again, beginning sort of with very basic concepts, defining what a seizure is, what epilepsy is, and what are the different types of seizures that um, one might encounter that some of your children may have. Um, and then move on to describe some of the life-threatening complications um, that can um, result from epilepsy. And this is basically, could also be titled, why it's important to, you know, to care about whether your child is having even brief um, you know, seizures or, or infrequent seizures. I'll, I'll review the, a little bit of the literature on epilepsy and autism in general, and then review what we know about epilepsy in um, 22Q13 deletion syndrome specifically, then describe some of our experience at Texas Children's Hospital. Um, and at the end, if we have time, I may skip this, um, describing uh, epilepsy in a new neuropsychiatric disorder that we described just last year, which is due to shame-free overexpression um, in mice or duplications in humans. So again, beginning from, the, from very basic concepts, what is a seizure? Well, a seizure is basically a transient disruption of brain function due to abnormal and excessive electrical discharges in the brain. And um, you know, the brain always is constantly, constantly has um, electrical discharges, but during a seizure, um, you have often very excessive, uh, abnormal, rhythmic discharges that occur. Um, individuals that have more than one unprovoked seizure, uh, by definition, have epilepsy. So that, that term unprovoked is a little bit important. That just means that um, seizures do not occur due to something like head trauma or a severe brain infection. So certainly anybody with a genetic abnormality that has more than one seizure um, without you know, those sort of provoking events has epilepsy. So what happens if your child does have a seizure, is diagnosed with epilepsy? Typically, um, what they'll have is an outpatient EEG, and um, most of the time this is done by placing electrodes on the scalp, um, cleaning the area, placing the electrode, placing an adhesive, um, so that um, the electro stays during a, about a one hour time, during which brain wave activity is recorded. Often this also involves an outpatient MRI. Uh, the reason for this is to evaluate uh, for any sort of structural abnormalities that might cause or predispose to epilepsy. And very often, most of the time, um, this will involve uh, medications being prescribed. So, um, what are the types of seizures that you might encounter? Well, um, seizure types, or sometimes we refer to them as semiologies, come in many flavors. One of the most common types that we see are staring spells. And staring spells can be a little bit tricky because I'm sure many of you have, have had the experience of talking to your physician and they tell you, well, if you're having a staring spell, that may just be an autism symptom, that may just be a behavioral event. Um, but, and that's certainly true sometimes. Sometimes those just simple staring spells can be a sign of a seizure. And specifically, there are two types of uh, seizures that can present as staring spells. One of those is what's called absence seizure, sometimes you may have heard it referred to as petty mal seizures. Um, these are staring spells that are typically pretty brief, usually only about 10 to 15 seconds, maybe 30 seconds or so. And they can occur with or without stereotypies, which are sort of repetitive, complex motor movements. I'll actually show you an example of absence seizure in a minute. Um, second type of uh, seizure that can uh, result in what appears to be just a staring spell is a complex partial seizure. This is a seizure, again, that um, 
can look like a scary spell, but often these last longer than a few seconds, maybe half a minute or a couple of minutes. Uh, these can also have other manifestations, such as eye deviation, where eyes are sort of locked to one side or the other rather than just staring straight ahead. And these can often evolve to other types of seizures, um, such as uh, a more generalized seizure that you think of with rhythmic shaking all over. Another uh, important difference between absence seizures and complex seizures that we at least as a neurologist think about is the frequency of, of how often they occur. The absence seizures sometimes occur in tens, hundreds of times a day. Complex partial seizures usually don't occur that frequently, maybe once or twice a day, maybe once or twice a week, or even less frequently. A um, third type of seizure is an atonic seizure, or often called a drop attack. I'll show an example of this in a minute. This is a very brief sudden loss of tone, either with just a little bit of head nodding or in the more full-blown manifestation with a complete drop to the ground. These can actually be very, um, very harmful because there's really no warning that one's about to happen, and there's complete loss of tone, and depending on where your child is, they may strike their head, and, and children often have to wear helmets to, to, to prevent uh, any sort of injury. Uh, another type of seizure is a tonic seizure, uh, and this is a, a seizure that's character, characterized by a generalized increase in tone um, without clonic movements. Clonic movements are sort of rhythmic movements that may be more familiar to everybody as a, as a, as a seizure. So this will be just an increased uh, tone, perhaps with some head deviation um, associated with it. Then there are generalized tonic-clonic seizures. These are probably things you, you've seen in, in you know, places like you know, on television or something like that. These are generalized rhythmic move, associated with generalized rhythmic movements. And then last uh, are myoclonic seizures. And these are also associated with jerky movements, but these are typically not um, uh, rhythmic sort of movements, but are sort of sporadic jerky movements. So I'm going to show you a few examples of different types of seizures. These are not children um, diagnosed with family derma syndrome, but I just wanted to, to give you some examples of different types of seizures that you might encounter. So the first will be an absence seizure. And at the beginning, uh, the child is being asked to breathe heavily or hyperventilate. Uh, and that's because this can actually induce um, an absence seizure. So she's not having a seizure, she's being asked to do and now, um, when she stopped breathing heavily, she started to have a seizure. You, you notice that she's sort of staring, it's a little bit hard to see, but you also notice some lip smacking, um, and then she's sort of peeking at her clothes, and that's one of the stereotypes that I talked about that can be associated with um, absence seizures. And in just a minute, she's going to come out of it, and someone's asking, asking her questions right now, she's not responding, responding to those, and then suddenly she comes out of it, and that's another characteristic of an absence seizure. Which is just sudden, um, suddenly someone's right back to their normal self. So next is um, a complex partial seizure. Um, and this one is not um, so much of a, a staring spell, although it somewhat starts that way. Um, but what you see here is that um, this child actually has sort of complex motor movement. If you watch her legs, it looks like she's sort of running or bicycling. Um, and so this is a seizure that comes from one area of the brain um, and that's actually causing abnormal movements of both sides. So if you look at her eyes, you can see the eye deviation over uh, to, to her left, or actually, sorry, to her right now. And she's slowly coming out of it, and they're starting to ask her questions. So these are all, um, part of the reason I'm showing you these examples is these are potentially questions that you may get from a neurologist if your child does have seizures and they're asking you about what happened. Okay, uh, next is an atonic or drop seizure. And um, in this case, um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, these seizures are characterized by a sudden loss of tone. And in this case, you're gonna see the child is just playing normally. Um, there's a, a nurse sort of throwing a ball and playing with her. And in a minute, you'll see that, that she'll have complete loss of tone, um, which is the seizure, which is very brief. And, and that is the seizure. It lasts a very short amount of time, often just a, a second or two, and then there's often um, re uh, complete recovery. 
Then last, I'll just show you an example of a uh, myoclonic seizure. And again, a myoclonic seizure is um, characterized by jerking movements, but these are not rhythmic jerking movements. They're sudden, and um, they occur suddenly, um, and then they go away quite quickly. And so another reason that I wanted to show videos today is um, often when parents come in, you know, they describe the event, and sometimes by the description it's very clear what the event is. It was a seizure, it was not a seizure. But I would say about a third or half the time, it's not really clear what it was, whether it was a seizure, whether it was a behavioral event. So having video always is very helpful for your neurologist or your physician that you're coming to to, the, to describe you know, these events. Because many times, just by the description, I really wasn't sure whether it's a seizure, but when I saw a video on, for example, on the cell phone, I could say, yes, that really looks like a seizure, or no, it doesn't. Okay. All right, so next up, I'm going to describe some of the life-threatening complications that have been associated with epilepsy, beginning with um, status epilepticus. So this is a state of uh, basically continuous or recurrent seizures that occur by definition over a 30 minute period, but uh, most people would say that if someone is having a continuous seizure greater than five minutes or recurrent seizures over a five minute period, but that meets the, the definition of um, status epilepticus. And status epilepticus is a potentially life-threatening um, condition associated with epilepsy. And many studies have, uh, have looked at the, uh, the mortality associated with this. This is just one example, where you can see that uh, a group of individuals who had a prolonged seizure but lasting less than an hour, most individuals did well afterwards and greater than 90% survived. Whereas individuals who had a very long seizure lasting more than an hour, um, there was significantly reduced uh, survival following this event. Um, after at about 30 days, but only uh, there's about 30 percent mortality associated with that. But the mortality associated with um, status epilepticus is age dependent, such that individuals that are significantly older, greater than 80 years of age, there's a very high incidence of, uh, of death. Whereas younger children um, and even younger adults, there's significantly less uh, mortality associated with this with this um, condition. And that's in part because of the cause of uh, the seizure in the age groups, with these individuals tending to, to have more devastating events such as strokes or, or, or cancer, whereas these individuals are more likely to have um, less devastating events or perhaps genetic disorders causing their status. So the second condition I wanted to describe today is, is uh, sudden unexpected death in ep epilepsy, or SUDEP. So um, SUDEP is different from mortality associated with status epilepticus, that is not necessarily associated with a prolonged seizure. And the seizure, uh, and, and SUDEP can occur just a few minutes after a seizure or even hours after a seizure has occurred. In this case, this is more common in adolescents and young adults. And we think it's probably more common in um, genetic causes of epilepsy than, for example, due to uh, a partial onset seizure because of, of some sort of brain trauma, for example. Um, most of them, uh, most individuals um, that suffer from SUDEP do have generalized seizures. Exactly what causes SUDEP is unknown, although there are multiple hypotheses. Part of the reason it's unknown is that it's a relatively rare condition. Um, but some hypotheses that have been put forward include autonomic dysfunction, which is basically the brain's regulation of, for example, heart rate and, and breathing, as well as apnea or prolonged pauses of breathing, as well as um, cardiac arrhythmias, abnormal heart rhythms. And this just shows one, uh, one study that uh, revealed that, um, that most individuals that suffer from SUDAP, or a good uh, proportion of individuals that suffer from SUDAP are um, late adolescent or um, young adult individuals, with SUDAP occurring less frequently in younger children and um, less frequently in older adults. So next I wanted to review some of the literature of epilepsy and autism in general. And there is certainly much more literature um, here than what I'll describe later for, specifically for phala McDermott syndrome. So the prevalence of epilepsy and autism has, and idiopathic autism has been fairly well established. 
And it's clear that high-functioning autistic children are less likely to develop seizures than children with autism and moderate to severe intellectual disability. So, um, um, so individuals with autism and intellectual disability, about 24% or so of these children have um, epilepsy, whereas high-functioning autistic children, it's only about 9%. But this should be taken in context with the, the normal prevalence um, of epilepsy, which is about 1 to 1.5% 1 in the general population. So you can see even for high-functioning autistic children that there's a significantly increased risk of epilepsy. Um, however, despite this increased risk of epilepsy, there's no particular seizure type that is specific to or, or more prevalent in autistic children. All sorts of um, seizure types have been described, including complex partial seizures, generalized seizures, absent seizures, tonic seizures, as well as aton. So one question that has come up as a potentially important question is whether the co-occurrence of epilepsy and autism is because of a, of a, a similar cause, or whether one may cause another. And the hypothesis that's been put forward most often is that perhaps seizures can lead to autistic behaviors, or abnormal discharges seen in the EEG could lead to autistic behaviors. And I'll just talk about that a little bit in, in a few minutes. So um, there have been now several studies that have looked for EEG abnormalities in autistic children. And this is in both in children with autism and epilepsy, as well as in children with autism without epilepsy. And what we see is that for both groups, there is a, a significantly a significant number that have abnormal EEGs. So if you just look here at um, the, the range of EEG abnormalities in children without who've never had a seizure, ranges from about six percent um, to as high as sixty percent, with most studies um, revealing a, a, a prevalence of abnormal EEGs of around thirty or forty percent. However, despite these, um, this significant number of individuals with autism having abnormalities on EEGs, there are really no consistent uh, specific findings on EEG, meaning that the abnormalities can vary from either things like diffuse slowing, uh, meaning that the background activity um, is abnormal, to actually having epileptiform discharges, such as multifocal discharges, focal discharges, or generalized bursts of abnormal activity seeming to come from all regions of the brain at the same time. There's also no uh, consistency in the frequency of these discharges, meaning some children very rarely have abnormal uh, discharges on the EEG, whereas other children with autism have very frequent discharges. And some, something that has uh, come up in, in several papers um, uh, that have looked uh, at more research-oriented parameters involving EEG is that there is abnormal power and coherence in autistic children. So what does this mean? So power is basically a measurement of the, um, of the amplitude of brainwave activity in, in children, whereas coherence is the synchrony of brainwave activity in different regions of the brain. And taken together, this has suggested um, especially the, the uh, decreased coherence uh, found on EEG in, in autistic children that there is abnormal con connectivity between brain regions in autistic children. And this has been borne out also using other methods such as functional MRI, which have found uh, similar findings. I think um, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip some of the data specifically about coherence and power. Um, and just come to, oh, um, and, and just um, come to the next question, which is, um, is it meaningful or useful to use abnormalities that you find in the EEG uh, to treat um, autistic children? And this is actually a very controversial area because there have really been no studies, large double placebo-controlled trials, um, looking at um, whether EEG abnormalities could be used as a biomarker um, for clinical trials or for uh, clinical practice. And there are some smaller trials that have investigated anti-epileptic drugs in the treatment of autistic children. Uh, the one that's been uh, most extensively studied is Valproate, with some, uh, some, some weaker data for another um, seizure medication called Demotrogene. So one study looked at Valproate uh, specifically for treatment of um, 
uh, behavioral symptoms in autistic children. And in this study, they used something that you heard a lot about earlier from, from Alex, which is the uh, ABC irritability scale. So children with um, autism but without epilepsy were treated with Valproate for a 12-week period. And um, the ABC irritability scale was performed um, on these children um, at three different time points. And what was found is that by 12 weeks of treatment, there was a significant decrease in children that had received Valproate compared to those that had received placebo. And when they looked at, when this group looked specifically at the um, individuals that had responded well to Valproate, what they found was that those that responded well to Valproate, uh, a significant number of them actually had abnormal EEGs. Um, either abnormal background or, or um, actual epileptiform activity. Whereas the, the single uh, individual that responded to uh, the placebo had a normal, uh, normal EEG. However, despite the, um, this positive result, uh, the same drug using the same scale in another study failed to reproduce this result. And here they found that Valproate had no significant difference in the same ABC irritability scale compared to um, uh, placebo-treated um, individuals. And this is a, um, um, uh, some, this is a part of the reason that, that, that this medication is not um, used um, for treatment of um, behavior abnormalities in autistic children. Another study looked at a, a different anti-epileptic drug, which is lamotrigine. Um, this study was initiated because there were several case reports, case series, suggesting that lamotrigine um, in, up to, in, in children with epilepsy who also had autism had some improvement in their behavior after initiating lamotrigine treatment. But what these authors found in this paper was that there was no significant change um, in behavior in children treated with lamotrigine compared to placebo using um, the autism behavior checklist. So next I wanted to review um, the literature specifically to phelan McDermott syndrome involved um, in terms of epilepsy. And um, at this point there are over 11 case series um, or um, prospective trials that have been conducted that include some mention of epilepsy in, in children included in the study. So the first was uh, the 2001 study from, from Dr. Phelan. Uh, which, in which she reported the findings of 37 individuals um, with uh, 22Q13 deletion syndrome and found 10 of those had seizures, which is about 27%. And as we go through this, you'll see about 27 to 30% is pretty consistent, uh, the pretty consistent finding. And we heard earlier today from uh, Dr. Benincourt that based on the registry data, that, that seems to be about the, the prevalence of epilepsy and phelan McDermott syndrome. But this study did not um, report um, what types of seizures were present in these children or what the uh, EEG findings were in these children. Uh, the next study from 2003 reported um, uh, that 36 of 52 individuals um, had um, seizures, about 70%. This is by far the highest uh, prevalence that we find in any of these studies. But uh, they also noted that there was no correlation with deletion size. And we heard earlier some of the data from the registry that also suggests there's no correlation with deletion size, suggesting that shank 3 is probably the cause of the gene uh, for seizures in these individuals. Um, but again, they did not describe what types of seizures they had or what types of uh, EEG abnormalities were present. Uh, another study in 2003 found similar results, about 24% of the kids included in this study had a, had a history of seizures. Again, no report of what type of seizures or EEG findings. And then several other studies, uh, I'm not going to go through all of these one by one, but basically found the same thing, which is somewhere around 27, 20, 33% um, of individuals with seizures. But again, not describing in great detail what type of seizures or what type of EEG abnormalities. This one in 2004 described that these three kids had petty mal and focal seizures, but not a lot more details than that. And then in 2007 and 2010, we see similar findings, 23 and 30% of children have seizures. Um, no report here of what type of seizures or EEG findings. Here, they did report that one child without epilepsy did have abnormal, an abnormal EEG, did not report exactly um, what the, that abnormality was. 
So the single uh, prospective study that we have, which we heard a lot about this morning, uh, described, uh, the, uh, described the 13 and 32 children enrolled in the study had a, had a history of seizures, which is about 41%. Um, seven of those had a history of febrile seizures, which is about 22%. Um, four of the 32 had a history of non-febrile seizures, which is 13%. And then two had a history of both febrile and non-febrile seizures. Six of the, of the children with a history of seizures did have, uh, were reported to have generalized seizures, with one having um, a history of complex seizures. It was also reported that 11 of the 32 had EEG abnormalities, but again, it's not described exactly what those abnormalities were. This is about 34%. Uh, a more recent study from earlier this year that probably many of you participated in uh, looked specifically at um, what happens as children with failing the Derby syndrome age. And um, one of the things they looked at was what is the prevalence of seizures um, as, as these children age. What they found was that overall they saw about a 27, that 27 percent of children uh, or the individuals had epilepsy. But interestingly what they found was that the prevalence of epi epilepsy significantly increased with age. Such that younger children Less around 10% or less had epilepsy, whereas as individuals with family dermis syndrome age, there's a much higher prevalence uh, in this study, around 60%. Of course, this needs to be replicated in future studies. Another study I wanted to bring your attention to is this one, where they were not specifically looking at family dermis syndrome, but instead at an epilepsy syndrome called lennox gastaut syndrome. So Lennox-Gastaut syndrome is not a genetic disorder. It's a, it's a description of a, a specific type of epilepsy. That is a, actually a very difficult to control epilepsy, often associated with multiple types of seizures, as well as a very specific EEG pattern. And when they looked at eight individuals who had Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, they found that one of those, and this is an adult now, um, had a deletion that included shank free. Uh, this individual had an 800 kV deletion um, it involves multiple genes, but also involves shank 3. And I'll come back to this idea of Lennox Gastaut possibly being a, I don't want to say a common finding, but a finding that occurs in some individuals with, um, with failing endurance syndrome. So, very recently, just really I think about a week ago, um, the first study um, that I've ever found um, was published that specifically looked at epilepsy and EEG abnormalities in children with deletions involving 22Q13. And this was a report of six um, individuals um, from Italy. And what you can see here, this is basically a, a map of the deletions um, of these six individuals. Three of them had epilepsy, two of them have myoclonic seizures, a history of myoclonic seizures, and one has a history of generalized uh, tonic-clonic seizures. However, there are a couple of things to note. Um, one of these three individuals shown here had an interstitial deletion. We heard a little bit about those earlier today, what those are, um, that did not involve shank 3. So I would not say this is a typical uh, case of Phelan McDermott syndrome. The second case here, um, which did have, who did have a deletion that involved shank 3, also had a history of um, a severe brain infection, meningitis very soon after birth. So whether or not the seizures were really due to um, this genomic abnormality or possible damage from a severe infection is not really clear. So um, that study looked at a total of six subjects, three of which had epilepsy. Again, as I mentioned, one had a, um, epilepsy but did not have a deletion encompassing shank 3. Second had meningitis. And the authors reported that all of these individuals had a relatively benign course with easily controlled seizures that occurred infrequently. And um, so I'll talk about it in a few minutes. Our experience, and I think the experience of probably many people here, is that this is not at least the case for all ch children or adults with family dermis syndrome. I'm not sure if it's really typical um, even. They also found that the EG abnormalities that they saw was primarily multifocal spike and wave activity. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more, I'll show some examples of EEGs in, in a minute and sort of our experience at Texas Children's Hospital. So some of the unanswered questions from the, um, from the data that we have from the literature include what is the spectrum of seizure types in children with Phelan McDermott syndrome? 
Then also, what are the EG abnormalities in children um, with family Darby syndrome, with or without seizures? And I think this is potentially important for some of the reasons you heard earlier today, which is for thinking about things like natural history studies and then potentially biomarkers for clinical trials, whether um, this would potentially be useful, um, a, a useful marker for those clinical trials or for um, uh, clinical efficacy um, in children with failing Derma syndrome. And then lastly, uh, what are the most efficacious anticonvulsants in children with family derma syndrome? We really have no information from the literature about that. So next I'll talk about our um, experience at Texas Children's Hospital. We follow um, now um, 17 children, or I should say 16 children and one adult with um, failing derma syndrome. And out of those, six have been diagnosed, uh, or have at some point had a seizure. Um, with five of the six clearly having epilepsy, one has a history of um, febrile seizures, and a couple have episodes that may or may not be seizures, um, have yet to determine that. Um, two of these individuals have been diagnosed with Lenz-Gastaut syndrome, which I have talked about before. This is very severe um, epilepsy, often associated with multiple types of seizures, and specifically associated on the EEG with generalized slow spike in wave activity. Um, interestingly, we have a third child who um, also has been diagnosed with epilepsy that has staring spells, um, which are all brief and occur several times per week. When I heard about this, this sounded very much to me like absence, potentially typical absence of seizures. But when we obtained an EEG, we did not see the pattern that we typically see for uh, childhood ep for absence epilepsy, but instead saw a very similar pattern to what we saw in these two children with Lance Gastaut, which is this burst of generalized slow spike wave activity. So let me just show you what this is, because I know many of you probably hear these EEG reports and hear about this and have no idea really what this means. So this is what a neurophysiologist will look at in terms of an EEG. And each of these squiggly lines basically represents a single electrode that's been placed on the scalp. And this uh, low amplitude fast activity at the beginning of this tracing represents basically normal activity, normal brainwave activity. And then after about three seconds of this tracing, you see this sudden, uh, these sudden spikes that occur in multiple leads on the CEG with a slow wave following. And this is the generalized slow spike wave activity um, that you see, at least in some of our children with failing endurance syndrome. And I'll show you another example here where again you see uh, basically this is normal activity for the first two or three seconds. Some of this very um, sort of spiky activity here representing just um, movement that occurred at that time. And then uh, during you know, a burst of abnormal activity you see this slow spike wave activity um, for a few seconds um, and then later returning to normal. Um, so, just sort of wrapping up the, the, the children that we've seen with epilepsy, um, uh, this child had uh, staring spells with um, altered awareness, but also a history of status epilepticus that uh, I talked about a bit earlier, and in this case did not have generalized discharges, but had what are called multifocal discharges, which um, basically are discharges that occur in different parts of the brain, but are not synchronized, so they don't occur at exactly the same time. And then there's this child that had just a history of a, a single febrile seizure and never had um, an EEG. So just summing up our experience, we do see seizures in, in our population uh, about 35% of the time, which is very, very much consistent with the literature and um, what's been presented today. Two of the six uh, children that we have seen have been diagnosed with Lenski-Gastaut syndrome, with the third having a very similar EG pattern, which is this generalized slow spike in wave um, abnormalities, um, which at this point it's not clear if that's a more common finding on EEG than, for example, focal abnormalities. Um, and I think it would be beneficial and interesting to uh, determine if that's indeed the case. So do I have a couple of minutes? Okay. Um, so last I was just going to sort of change topics just a, a little bit and talk about a, a new neuropsychiatric disorder that we described late last year, which is due, in this case, not to loss of a copy of shank-free, but actually to too much shank-free um, due to 
uh, a duplication uh, of involving that gene, or as I'll show you in a minute, um, overexpression in mice that we engineer to, to make too much of shank free. So um, we've seen um, at this point, I think, two, sorry, three individuals with duplications involving shank free. And I'll really just talk about the, um, uh, the clinical features of one of those. Um, this child, seven-year-old right-handed little girl, um, was known to have developmental delay, but she had actually a fairly mild developmental delay. Uh, she walked a little bit late, so her first word a little bit late. Um, but then by first grade, was in a mixture of um, regular and resource classes, um, speaking in full sentences, was um, following commands, was, and was able to uh, participate um, in, in class and in with her parents. She was diagnosed with um, ADHD, um, and was found to be poorly responsive to uh, the typical medications that you would get for ADHD. Um, when she came to see us, um, she came because she was having these behavioral arrests that were occurring at least one time per week. She was also having other behavioral events where she had, that were associated with confusion, some irritability, as well as some cyanosis, some, some blueness around her lips, as well as her fingertips, um, but were not associated with clear abnormalities. And actually, when she came to me, she was uh, already known to carry a uh, duplication involving shank free. And so, because of these, these events that sounded potentially like seizures, we obtained an EEG uh, from her. And what we found was a slightly a similar but, but slightly different um, finding. Again, you see uh, basically normal low amplitude activity occurring here. And then we would frequently, frequently see these bursts of generalized um, spike and wave activity. But in contrast to what I showed you earlier, um, the frequency of the of this spike wave activity is much faster um, than, we, than what we have seen in uh, failing McDermott syndrome, occurring about um, three times per second. And also, interestingly, um, in this child, we would see either, as in this case, that when you had photic stimulation, which is basically just some flickering lights that occur in the room to see if it can induce a seizure, we would very frequently see these bursts of abnormal activity. In this child, we would also see these, this abnormal activity when we would ask her to hyperventilate. In the second child with a shank free duplication, we, we saw a similar pattern, um, in this case just with hyperventilation, which is uh, basically normal activity um, early on and then this faster um, spike wave activity occurring with hyperventilation. And so this was um, interesting to us because for various reasons, we had decided to create mice that actually make too much shank free. So you heard a lot about mice that make too little. We had made mice that make too much shank free. And one of the strongest phenotypes that we saw was that these mice very frequently have seizures. And uh, just shown here is, is a mouse, is one of our shank free overexpressing mice having a seizure. And uh, this would occur spontaneously without doing anything to them. And when we did EEG um, with these mice, what we found is that the overexpressing, or labeled here transgenic mice, had also generalized discharges um, occurring uh, that were never seen in wall type mice, and we could actually report seizures from these mice as well. Okay, so um, that's what I wanted to present today. Hopefully, I, I gave you some some information that will be useful, and I'm sure there are lots of questions that I didn't address. I'll be around, of course, for the Q&A and then and tomorrow morning as well. I did want to mention that we are recruiting patients um, uh, to extend our study on epilepsy and EG abnormalities in children with family derma syndrome. And I'll be in one of the Boca rooms um, tomorrow morning if anyone is interested. Um, I also wanted to thank um, a neurophysiologist at, at Texas Children's Hospital, Gloria Diaz, who has helped tremendously with um, interpreting EEGs and providing some of that data, as well as uh, Huda Zogby at Baylor College of Medicine, who I collaborate with and uh, with some of the basic science work, including making the shank-free overexpressing mice, and then some funding sources. So thank you.